Hi, I'm Dan Bettinger, the Application Science Team Lead uh, from Cartera, and I'm here with Tom Yuan uh, from Twist Biosciences. Tom, uh, I want to congratulate you on the recent publication in Antibody Therapeutics and for all the great work you and your team are doing, um, discovering antibody cocktails to Ebola. So, Tom, can you tell me a little bit about your role at Twist Bioscience? Yeah, so I'm currently at Twist Bioscience in the Twist Biopharma vertical. So a lot of my focus is on the discovery antibodies and the optimization of existing antibodies. Um, one of the big, uh, like you mentioned, so for this particular publication, one of the workflows we really wanted to highlight was, is how do we harness the high throughput of Twist synthetic biology platform with the high throughput as PR of the Cartera LSA. Um, so this publication uh, was first started by um, Yasmina and Aaron um, at Twist to uh, really highlight uh, how the two workflows really synergize with each other. Great. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say to introduce the paper before we go on to the first figure? Or? Right. So. This paper originates from um, the Bornhaut et al. Uh, publication where we're, the, um, there's a large number of neutralizing antibodies for Ebola glycoprotein. Um, so what we're doing here is not the discovery of new antibodies. What we're doing here is the verification and clarification of the epitope bins, the competitive epitope bins of this set of existing anti-Ebola uh, antibodies. Um, what we are able to do at Twist, however, is that we can synthesize each one of these antibodies starting from just the protein sequence. Um, so we don't need any, any existing, we don't need any existing material. The only mat physical material that we need is the antigen itself. So this is the soluble Ebola glycoprotein antigen. It's very interesting. So. Um, can you walk us through a little bit about the twist discovery technology and the workflow for this project in particular, you know, how you were able to in 28 days get through this first set of characterization round and then follow that very rapidly up, I think what, another eight days uh, with the second tier analysis to even refine that further. Right. So uh, because this is not a on the outside of a discovery project, we already had existing antibody sequences to start with. Uh, we took those sequences, the antibody sequences, and reformatted them into our internal expression vector. Um, our twist, we're able to, we have our inter own internal expression vectors, but we're also able to take customer expression vectors and synthesize it in those vectors as well. Um, so in this case, we're, imp we're inputting the, uh, the antibody sequences uh, originally discovered uh, against Ebola and uh, reformatting them and putting them into the synthesis uh, pipeline. So that large 14-day span incorporates the oligo printing. It incorporates the uh, cloning of that of these assembled oligos into the full length um, of VH and VL uh, into, uh, to express these antibodies. And it also incorporates the cloning into the final expression vector and the delivery of the DNA. So that that those 14 days uh, encapsulates that entire uh, process. So when we actually submitted this, we submitted this in the exact same way that a customer would submit the sequence via the e-commerce platform. Uh, once we have those DNAs in hand, then we typically do a one mil, small one mil expression uh, for all these antibodies. And we, we like to automate as much as this is possible. So we automate these on Hamilton systems and they undergo protein A purification. Um, once the antibodies are purified and uh, ex expressed and purified, which takes about four days, we set up a first pass binning. And the idea of the first pass binning is that uh, because um, you have so many antibodies and uh, you have a single antigen to bin against, a competitively bin against, um, that matrix, the size of your matrix increases, obviously, uh, for every single antibody that you encode in it. So the first pass antibody, uh, sorry, the first pass binning, uh, what that allows you to do is that um, you test for uh, blocking of every single antibody against every other antibody for the same antigen. Um, because of, because you have larger, a larger and larger subset of that, it allows you to uh, find the immunodominant epitopes, but it also allows you to find 
extremely rare epitopes as well um, without any existing benchmark controls uh, uh, or known antibody binders to begin with. Um, in this paper, we, do, we did have, we specifically chose this antigen and these sets of antibodies because there were well-defined controls, but the, the workflow of defining these epitopes is completely agnostic of having those, those um, benchmark antibodies available to begin with. Um, so this entire process, uh, including the expression and purification of the antibodies itself, you know, these are routine workflows that we work with, that we use lies at twist for our both internal discovery projects and our client discovery projects. Um, and uh, the, the purpose of that first pass has been, uh, as you've shown here in, in I believe the second figure. Yes, um, figure two. In figure A, it, yeah, figure two. Uh, it's showing the basic uh, format of running these epitope bins. So in, in this case, we're using a premix format for the epitope bins. We will directly couple the ligand antibody onto the chip and then premix the secondary antibody or the analyte antibody uh, at five-fold molar excess with the uh, Ebola, Ebo-V glycoprotein um, antigen in solution. And then we'll measure for either blocking um, or non-blocking of, of that interaction with the, 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 the ligand-coupled antibody. Um, the, so, like I mentioned, for the first pass, it's, it's completely agnostic of having any specific benchmarks, but what we're doing with this first pass is that we're generating sort of our own internal benchmarks to, uh, that we'd like to use in the second pass binning. Uh, one thing to note here is that the, the, the first pass binning, because we have so many you know, um, and we we do want to collect as much data as possible. You know, not all of the antibodies are expressed to the same level, um, but uh, we do get enough ant reagent to to process most of them. And we're not, for example, we're not individually neutral normalizing the concentrations of every single antibody that's that's being expressed here. Right. We're doing sort of a bulk process where we will um, dilute every antibody. We'll we'll measure the concentration of every antibody, but we'll bulk dilute these antibodies so that we, we reach a five-fold molar excess um, compared to the, the, the ABOV antigen itself. Um, during the actual processing step for the epitope binning, we will double check and QC the actual interaction of these antibodies with, with uh, the ABOV um, antigen itself to make sure that we, we're fully measuring functional binding of that Ebola uh, antigen with the, the coupled antibody. Um, and that way we can be sure that any blockade that we measure during the epitope binning is actually a true blockade and it's not, say, your antigen or your antibody being degraded over the regeneration cycles or your antigen not being fully formed. Um, so that's also why you see in figure C that it's not the full, uh, it's not a one-to-one -one matrix where you have, it's, you know, it's, there's more ligands than there are analytes. And that's because we did have to remove some of those trace, uh, some of those sections because we weren't able to fully re recapture active binding in you know a portion of those antibodies. Yeah, and if they weren't high concentration, you couldn't necessarily assume that they'd fully inactivate the trimer, right? So you had to Correct. rely on those from the ligand side. Yeah, I mean it's still very impressive that in this you know sort of single pass experiment, you were able to group you know, more than 200 clones into these seven communities. That's uh, quite a bit of resolution and in, in throughput for this type of assay, I think. Yeah, I mean, that's what's exciting about running this in such a high throughput manner is that, you know, just by the power of having uh, retesting the same ligands over and over and over again, that you can really define, you know, both confirm that if it falls into immunodominant epitope that you have this big block but if it's a rare epitope, then that you're constantly getting non-blocking, except in that one specific, uh, uh, you know, matrix. Right. So maybe we can zoom in a little bit on figure three. So this is the, the second pass experiment um, where you focused in a bit more uh, on a smaller number of clones. Um, can you describe sort of the experimental approach or what was intended with this? You know, optimized experiment. Right. Here. So, right. So the the idea behind the second uh, pass epitope bin is, um, like I mentioned, the first pass epitope bin. It's sort of a quick and dirty assay. Um, we obviously do go through the data and make sure that we see functional uh, binding and blockade. 
But in the second pass binning, the idea is if we don't have existing benchmarks, we can self-select our own um, benchmark antibodies, or we call them pathway antibodies from that first set of epitope binning. And the way we select that is if we have, uh, uh, we select one, at least one or two antibodies from each epitope bin or community block community that we see in that first pass bin. And then we confirm that it has very good ligand binding to the, uh, sorry, very good binding to the uh, glycoprotein itself as well. Um, in this case, we're also throwing in known structural benchmarks um, for EVOV glycoprotein uh, just to see if they, uh, uh, if they correspond to the initial bins that were uh, assigned in, in the literature. Um, so for the second set of antibodies, or second set of the epitope bin, we scale up the antibodies and we, the scale up allows us to collect more antibody, more region, and we're also normalizing the entire plate so that we have less loss of, um, you know, specific antibodies that don't, don't express well. You know, we make sure that um, of a well-normalized plate of all the antibodies of the same concentration, and then we repeat the epitope bin. And this lets us do two things. This lets us uh, reconfirm that the bins are, are is, is, the binning is, rep, is is able to be repeated, and also that the the rare epitopes that we do find um, still show the same blocking behavior as we had seen previously as well. Um, so that's kind of the the, the reason why we do the, the second pass binning. Great. Um, so let's go to figure four now. Um, so you do a great job in the paper of describing and comparing the SPR binning to the fax binning results. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you view those two techniques and how the assays scale and fit into your discovery workflow typically? All right. So, so what we have done here is obviously uh, different. This is uh, SPR binning, high throughput SPR binning. Fax binning is a great technique. Um, the one of the downsides was that it's it's typically a few on many approach. So you will have, say, um, some known benchmark antibodies, and then you'll test many other antibodies against that smaller group of, anti of those antibodies. Um, the problem with that is that you don't get that two byte uh, that, that that matrix uh, heat map matrix that you can generate with a high throughput antibody, where one every single antibody is tested against every other antibody in the same set. Um, and you, that way you lose some bit of some, some resolution. Um, what you see in this specific figure is that we've um, generated a phylogenetic tree of, of, of these antibodies and looked at their epitope bin that was assigned initially in the Bornholt paper by fax. So the outer ring, uh, the outer ring on this um, in figure A or subfigure A is uh, the assignment from, from the Bonhoeffer Bonhoeff paper. Um, you'll see that there is some, uh, uh, some sections that are white. So those were uh, uh, antibodies that were not able to be assigned to an epitope bin initially. And then on the inner ring is the assignments that we generated from our high throughput epitope binning completely separate from their binning. Um, and you'll see that in many cases, in mo the vast majority of cases, actually, that the, the bins completely agree. There are some cases where there's a disagreement, but for the vast majority of these clones, they completely agree. And you also see that we are able to assign some of the more difficult to bin antibodies by this technique that were initially not assigned. That's great. So I was curious uh, from reading this. Uh, were you surprised to see that you had MABs from the same germline family? appearing in different epitope bins and also you know about how much cdr variation do you think you need to see for them to separate into different epitope clusters or communities All right that's a really good question so um we have we, we do note that in with some commensal pathogens such as staph aureus and yellow fever virus that in many cases the neutralization seems very strongly germline encoded um for an antigen like Ebola or a virus like Ebola, it, we don't tend to see that. And you can see that both in the in the epitopins from the fax data and also from the epitopin from the high throughput SPR binning as well, where you'll see very similar, at least by sequence, it looks very similar in terms of uh, uh, the antibodies be very similar, but they'll they'll bind to vastly different epitopes. Um, and this is you know one of the reasons 
where you you know it's it's always critical to test for the epitope itself, um, not just assume or not base your dis antibody discovery efforts just based on sequence diversity. Um, so that's 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 part of the power of this and part of the um, you know the advantage of doing uh, using a workflow like this. That's a really good point. Um, let's see if we can go to. So can you talk a little bit about how the mechanism of action of these different antibodies varies and you know, maybe just kind of give us your interpretation of this figure and what you found? Right. So, um, you know, in general, the mechanism of action uh, in terms of finding antibodies to successfully neutralize a viral pathogen, it's obviously very important to uh, broaden your epitope diversity, epitope diversity as much as possible. Um, part of the reason of this is that, it, for example, in say the common cold or influenza, there are immunodominant epitopes that um, that the virus has uh, evolved to um, be highly immunodominant. So most of the antibodies they would generate for a specific epitope, but that is highly mutated year to year. So that's part of the reason why you you know we don't have a a single influenza vaccine that can um, work indefinitely, right? Uh, so for, um, you know, in some cases, for example, for SARS-CoV-2, um, certain, um, certain antibodies will only bind, say, the um, up version or the down, down version of the, of the spike protein itself. Um, not all antibodies will be able to uh, access both, both confirmations. Um, you know, for any antibodies that we discover, we obviously want to, you know, be able to hit as many epitopes as possible, whether that's directly blocking, say, the, the, the binding domain that actually infects, or whether you're binding to another domain and another epitope that's able to lock, you know, your antigen, whether it's Ebola, GP, or whether it's the SARS-CoV-1, S1 um, spike protein into a confirmation that is unable to confer infectivity. Um, you know, so that's yeah, so being able to, you know, broaden your, your epitope diversity is really key to that. Um, yeah, there, there's quite a few surfaces that can provide, you know, potential neutralization activity for some of these viral constructs. So it, it's great that this model system, you know, ha had so many different mechanisms involved that are that are so distributed around the protein. It's right. a really great case for uh, this type of epitope binning, I think. Well, so Tom, we really want to thank you for uh, taking this time today with us to to talk about this paper and uh, describe your research on Ebola and antibody discovery in general. And so. Uh, you know, we know you guys are doing a lot of work also on the COVID-19 project, and we're rooting for your success uh, on that. And uh, yeah, yeah, so thanks for meeting with us today. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Or? No, just thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you just to yourself and also Cartera for having me on. Um, I've really enjoyed working with um, the, the LSA system itself and with everyone at Cartera. And, you know, I think the you know, this whole concept of, you know, trying to, uh, I think synthetic biology and the, the LSA platform are, you know, really go well hand in hand. And I think um, we'll see more and more great data come out of it. All right. Well, thank you very much. Have a great day, Tom. Thanks for talking with us. Thank you. Bye.